All right, good morning, everyone. We will get started. Um, real quick, sorry to pull off the good music, get this show going. Um, my name is Cassie. Uh, you might have gotten emails from me from Cassandra, but I go by Cassie. It looks like we've got an interesting mix in here today. We've got some new ones and some renewals. So we'll just kind of step through all the different forms and I'll um, go over the ones where we have uh, some significant changes for those of you that are in here renewing. Um, and for those of you that are new, it's just all new to you. So real quick, I wanna get, I'm gonna launch a poll to see kind of who all I have in here so I can make sure that I am going over the right topics. So hopefully you can see the poll. Yes, no, maybe so. Can you see the yes. poll? Okay. Let me know who you are, if you're new, so I can make I'm sure not I'm not seeing it, Cassie. You're not? I'm not, but others might. Lisa said she saw it. Okay, it just okay, got Lisa might. It perfect. Okay. Oh, people are answering, so cool. I've also got Lisa King in here. She is one of our CCFP peeps, as I call them. And she's gonna be going along with us. All right. So we don't have any family daycare home today, so I don't need to go over that. Cool. We've got, got some schools. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. That helps me. And I know what I need to go over and what I need to not go over. So I have a tendency to just ramble on and just talk about all kinds of stuff. And if at any point something I say doesn't make sense, you're welcome to unmute yourself. We don't have a large group in here. So unmute yourself, interrupt me, ask questions. That's what this is for. Um, we kind of are getting more laid back. This is our, it feels like maybe the 27th training. I'm not sure how many we've done now. Um, and I see some people returning, so that's great. So hopefully you've gotten in there and have new questions and that's what this is for. So interrupt me. If you are in the process of filling your application and you're stumped on something, that's why we're here, okay? And if you're brand new, if something doesn't make sense, put it in the chat, speak up. All right, you too, Lisa. Lisa's in here in my office. If I say something doesn't make sense, holler at me. Yeah, okay. All right, so I always like to make this disclaimer that I'm logged in as myself and it's gonna look differently than when you log in because I have different buttons and access to stuff. So if your screen doesn't look quite like mine, that's why. Um, but it's just easier this way so I can switch around and show you guys everything you need to see. And also, um, this is just a test account. So you're gonna see just junk in here. So um, disregard some of the crazy stuff you'll see. Okay, so when you first log in and you click on your business associated with you, um, and if you're multi-sided or if you have more than one institution, some of you, when you log in, you might have more than one business associated with you. But everyone, you'll click your business and you'll come to this um, maintenance page. And all of our applications are important, but this might be the most vital page that you can make sure it's always up to date because this is no, this is how we know where to send stuff. We know who to call and harass when we need to talk to you guys. So make sure it's, it's current and it's correct. Um, all of this in your business information should be correct. Um, but if something doesn't look right, let us know because a lot of all of this up here, not a lot of it, all this in this section, you guys can't change. Um, the type of institution you are, if you're a tribe, military, or a public school, you should be a public, set as a public institution in all of these areas. Um, if you are a private nonprofit, obviously it would say that. And then the vast majority of our participants are um, for-profit institutions. Um, daycare, who are daycare centers. So if something doesn't look right, we got to change it. You got to let us know. All of your addresses here, you guys have the ability to change that. And for many of you, these all might be the same, but it's important for us to know where we need to send our correspondence, um, where we can find you for this site, and then where you're keeping your records. And those all could be different and they may all be the same, but it's important that we know uh, where, where they are. And then this section for your owner, executive director, superintendent, we can't put enough titles in there to capture all the different names and titles we have of people because we have so many different types of institutions that are on this program. But this is the section where we need to know who is the main person, the main person in charge. So for a school, it'd be a superintendent. For a nonprofit, it'd be like your CEO, um, an executive director, that type of person. And then um, for all you for-profits, it's the owner. 
And many times we know that those people may not have, um, may not bear a lot of the weight and the work in the program, but they're still ultimately the responsible ones. We have to identify who that person is. So make sure that that is the correct person um, for your institution type. Um, and then you guys are able, let me back up, you can't change the section, only we can. So as that person changes, or if we have the wrong person in there, let us know, email your person. I will say that over and over, send it to your person. And how you know who your person is, is to come down here and look at the assigned office staff. Um, if you're a single-sided daycare uh, for childcare or adult care, Lisa King is your person. If you run the at-risk program, it's Jennifer Pryor. And if you have more than one site and you're a sponsor, it's Lori Burroughs. So just so that you know who your person is. And if you're brand new right now, you're unfortunately having to deal with me. I help all the new ones and for, for the initial process. Um, so let us know if this isn't right. And for those of you that are renewing, this is important for you to know that if we got this information in here and it's wrong, it was, it was coming from last year's um, application. And so we just took what you had and what was current at that time. So if it's wrong, let us know. Your authorized reps, this section, you guys can add anyone you need here. So anyone that you might not otherwise have a place to put in the application, which if you're single-sided, the only other place to put anyone's name would be um, on the application for participation. So you might, your owner might be here and then you'd list your director over there. But I go ahead, it's just their name and title over there. Give us their information. If you have other people that have anything to do with CACFP, put them here so that when we have questions or things we need to reach out about, we can bug the right person. And like I said, you guys can um, make add or remove or any edit any of these that are here. And then a lot of these things you're not gonna see on your page, but one thing that you do have on yours is your fiscal year. And it's important for you to list the correct fiscal year um, because many times we'll ask for you to report stuff to, to us based on your fiscal year. And we operate this program from October to September. That's regulatory and it's based on the federal fiscal year, but a lot of you might not operate on that same fiscal year. So we just need to know what is your fiscal year. Most of you that are for-profits, you're just gonna be January to December. Um, Nonprofits, you know, it might be October to September, who knows? And then all our schools, it's completely different. You guys do July to June. So just make sure it's correct. All right. So I'm gonna go step through this as a single-sided institution first, because I think that's the vast majority of the, the folks we have in here. Um, and then I'll go and switch it over to multi-sided so we can see the sponsor stuff. But if you click on applications, that should be the only button, unless you're multi-sided that you see at the top. Click on applications. And if you don't have a fiscal year 23 application, you've got to insert it yourself. And I'm not going to do it again because I already have one, but you'll just put in 2023 and click add new renewal. And then you'll have one sitting there pending submission, just like I do. You'll click select and it'll take you to your online application checklist is what we refer to this as. So um, those of you that are renewing, hopefully right off the bat, you see that this is a much shorter, it's more condensed. There's not as many forms. We've tried to eliminate some of the stuff that was on there before that you just didn't need. Some forms are there for others and aren't for others because it just depends on what type of institution you are. So hopefully that um, seems a lot less um, work right off the bat. And um, the budget, we've had lots of changes too as well. That's probably why most of you are here through the budget changes, but I'm gonna step through all these forms. So the first one is our VCA, our Viability, Capability, and account Accountability Questionnaire. If you're brand new, you had to fill out a paper form of this that has many of these questions, well, all of these questions, except for these first five, I think. So you're gonna just take that paper form, transfer your questions once your VCA was approved. Those are the correct, you know, you had, adequate responses. So just put them from what was on the paper form. If you're a renewal, this just rolled forward from what you had last year. Okay. And so um, we approved it last year. You're going to roll it forward. You still need to go in and make sure that the, the responses are valid. I mean, because you could change your processes and procedures throughout the years, but typically when you're talking about your record keeping and your accounting, um, you know, you kind of keep the same processes. But still, roll through this, this form, see if any updates are needed. 
I will tell you, we added a couple of things. We made a couple of changes on here. And one of them is on number seven. So those of you that have a renewal, um, last year we just had you tell us what kind of accounting method you, you had um, that you used. But we added these multiple choice here because we had some folks that were just, they didn't know what the different um, types of accounting methods we had listed meant. And really, if you don't, we don't need fancy words or labels. We just need to know how you do it and that it's, um, you know, you're doing it the right way. And that when we come out and do a review, we see that that's what you're doing. So if you're not sure what kind of accounting method you have, that's fine. You can click other and just explain, how are you keeping up with your, your um, expenditures and your revenue, okay? Um, so what form am I on? So Molly, are you with a public school? I didn't think we had it in here. So I'm on the very top one. Oh, you're a child care center. The reason I asked is because public schools, I didn't think we had any in here, but I should clarify that if we do have some public schools that operate the at-risk only, um, your, your list is much smaller. And some of these things you do not have to do all together. And so everyone but a public school on at-risk is gonna have this very top form. And that's what I'm on. Some of the other changes that we made on this form are, let's see, number 10 and 11 and 13. Last year we said, please list the name and title of person who yada, yada, yada. And I'll apologize because probably a good portion of you got this form kicked out and we told you, you gotta go back and put a name. Well, we realized that was too, um, that was too restrictive. We don't need names, we just need titles. So. This would have rolled forward with names of people in it um, last year, and, and people are still struggling staying fully staffed. And we realized now that it was not reasonable to make you list names when it was, it's been like a revolving door for some of you. So this rolled forward. If you're a renewal with names, just delete them. Delete the names, make sure the titles are listed here. That's what we're after. And if you're brand new, you wouldn't have known that any different anyway. Again, scroll through all these questions, make sure that they're still applicable to how you're operating. Um, you gotta click this and say that you understand that we can't backdate applications. So in years past, it's been confusing um, about when our deadline was because we can't pay claims past 60 days. And so it was kind of like a moving target whenever you had to get your application submitted. And we decided we needed to be consistent and we can't backdate anything really anyhow. So we just made the rule that if your application, I shouldn't say rule, well, it's our state policy now, but if your application was submitted any time or before the end of October, so by October 31st, you're eligible for that month. So if you don't submit this application initially by November 1st, or if you don't do it and you do it on November 1st, we can't allow you to claim October. So you got to get it submitted. You've got still got a few weeks, well, a couple weeks left to get it submitted by that deadline. That doesn't mean you have to be approved. It just means it's gotta be submitted, okay? Once you submit it, we have 30 days to review it and then get back with you either with corrections that are needed or approval. And I can tell you already that the approval process is going um, quicker and smoother than last year, mostly because we changed the budget and it's um, far less cumbersome. The biggest holdup right now is getting you guys to submit the doc new documents that we require. And I'll talk about that more in a little bit. So you will have to go this through this form, make any corrections and resubmit. One thing you might've also noticed when, if you're a renewal application is that when you put in the 2023 application, these four forms, your meal policy, civil rights, public release and state agency institution agreement, those rolled forward, both submitted and approved. And that's done on purpose. So don't think there's some kind of weird error, um, which we have plenty of those in the system. But this is not one of them. So, this application and agreement is actually permanent until it's not. And I always say that, it sounds kind of silly, but the only reason it wouldn't be is if you just choose not to participate anymore, maybe you close or you just don't want to do it, um, or you unfortunately become terminated. That's the only reason that this agreement would ever end. So we're really making you guys do um, a lot every year that maybe we don't have to redo every all of it. And if you're doing your application and keeping up with it like you should be, it should be current all the time. We tell you guys that when I, you know, your meal times change or people change or what have you, you got to come back and update it then. Same thing with your budget. In the past, I think we've gotten into a rut where we 
we did our application, it was approved, and then we didn't think about it for another year. And so we're slowly getting out of that frame of mind that if it's kept up to date and it's current, this application process should be a breeze for you. And so more of these forms in the future are going to roll forward in a submitted and already approved status um, so that it's easier. So right now, these four are the only ones you'll see like that. Next year, this one will roll forward that way. The reason we couldn't do it like that is because we changed some stuff on it. And so anytime we change something, we'll need you to resubmit it so that we know that, you know, you had to update it and we'll reapprove it. But it might sound petty, but one less form you have to click open and it submit is one less form we have to go in and approve and it will make things go quicker. But I will advise you to step through them and make sure nothing needs changed. This no policy statement, you just have to agree to it. So there's nothing that needs to be changed on here. If you do click this again, we will have to approve it, no big deal. But you have to agree to that. Civil rights is one that you really should open up and click to this next page and scroll through and make sure nothing has changed. It should have rolled forward um, complete. And the only thing I could really anticipate you guys it ever changing, which might be far and few between, might be six and seven. You know, this is telling us how that you're in compliance with civil rights and how you're reaching out in the community, so on and so forth. And um, number five has to be checked. That's just you acknowledging, yep, I've had my civil rights, my key staff have had it, and I'm maintaining those records on file. You don't have to send those to us anymore. Um, you keep them in your file, and when we come out for a review, we will look for it and verify you've had it. Um, okay, number six and seven is that they might change, but they may not. This is just talking about any linguistic needs you have in your centers. Um, we need to know if there's other languages spoken. We have to report that to USDA. And we also have to make sure that if you have other languages and you need materials in those languages that we can provide that if necessary. But if nothing's changed on this form, open it up, scroll through, read your responses. You don't need to submit. You simply need to click return to checklist. Public release, same thing here. So if you are brand new, you're not gonna see this and you shouldn't. If you're a renewal, if you are renewing your application from last year and you don't see this, um, let us know because it should be there. And that means I missed something when I um, approved you basically. So when you come on brand new, everyone has to do a public release. You have to announce to the public that you're participating in this program and what it is. And here's the statement right here. You can click on that and it pulls up our public release. And you have to fill that out and send it to some type of publication. Send us proof that you did it and ask them to um, publish it. You do not have to pay for it. And I know a lot of publications aren't gonna publish something for free, but we just have to see that you tried to get it published to um, some type of publication. And then you have to send us the, the proof. But if you are a renewal, you can just opt into our statewide public release. Every year after applications are done, um, we print up a list of everyone that opts into this. We send it to our communications and we've done it for you. So if you're a renewal and that's clicked and you're in approved status already, you don't have to do anything here. I will advise you that if you go to your page and you see some old data here. Brenda, what is your DC number? If you'll type it in there in the chat, maybe Lisa, you can go turn it on for. Okay. Lisa can get you hooked up and get it on there. So that would be an exception. If you were new last year and this box isn't on there, um, we will have to get it turned on and you'll have to resubmit this one. But I was gonna say here, if you have some old information from years prior, if you delete it, it's gonna unsubmit it and you're gonna have to resubmit it. No big deal. You can delete it if you want, or you can leave it there if you want. It doesn't matter. Your state agency institution agreement. This one's been rolling forward, submitted and approved for several years now. Um, I advise everyone to print this off because it's a, it's a document that changes over time. And one of our system flaws is that sometimes on some of these pages, if we're not careful, if we change something on this form, it changes it back to the beginning of time. And there's no way to, to really capture what was there before. So this agreement, this page, when you pull it up, is going to look exactly the same one as when you first came on, but we might have changed things from year to year. So the only way really to capture that and to know what you're agreeing to each year is to take a copy of it, print a paper copy, put it in your file. If you're ever wondering where this it, something is in writing that we came up with or where does it say that you didn't know you had to do that or so on and so forth, this is where it's at. And it's 12 pages long. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I would 
advise you to come through, go through here, print your form, file it. You don't need to do anything with this form. It does not need resubmitted or reapproved. Okay, so if you're a for-profit, you're not going to see this form. We changed this this year. So prior to this year, everyone had this, but it was called the owner slash board member page. And it was just kind of confusing and redundant. We had a section that was, you put your owner and then you had a section you put your board members. And inevitably we had folks that would put something in both areas and it wasn't needed. So that's why we um, have really beefed up, I'm gonna hop back here, this section. Now we're capturing that owner person here. We don't need a form for that. So that's why if you're a for-profit now, you're not gonna see this extra form because we have your owner on that first page and we've got what we need. If you're a nonprofit, you do have to report a board, okay? And it should roll forward with what you had last year. You do have to record the date of your last board meeting and you do have to submit the minutes that support that. And people are like, why do you need this? And so here's the thing, if you're a nonprofit, your, your board really should have knowledge and be aware of the goings on about CACFP. They may not know how to op fully operate it, but they are re responsible for the general oversight of the program. Um, so we do eventually, we are eventually gonna start looking a little closer at these and making sure at some point your board does really discuss CACFP because um, it is their responsibility. If you're ever seriously deficient or SD, um, your board president will get a, a certified letter from us saying like, hey, this is going on, this isn't right, here's what happened, here's what you need to do to fix it. And though that board president will be held responsible for getting those corrections made. And sometimes I don't think nonprofits understand that. So only nonprofits have to do this form. And you've got to go in there and put in that date. And you've got to also send us the minutes and send the minutes to your person. Disclosure of lobbying activities. I don't know of anybody currently that legitimately does this that participates in our program. But the purpose of this form is if you if you truly lobby. It has to be reported and you can't use our forms, our forms, our funds to pay for lobbying. I don't know anyone that does that. Um, so if that doesn't apply to you, which is probably everyone in here, you're just gonna scroll down and submit. That's it. So really so far, all you guys have had to do if you're for profit is update this form. Just make sure none of these need changed. Print this one. If you're a nonprofit, make sure this is up to date and resubmit. Submit this one because you're probably not lobbying. And that brings us to our application for participation. So everyone has this form. If you're multi-sided, um, you might have, you'll have, or you'll have as many forms here of those applications as you do sites. But the form is just the same except for one difference and I'll talk about that later. So, well, there's actually two differences. So in this general section here, this right here populates from the, the business maintenance page. Um, and if anything's wrong, you need to let us know. Site, the site representative information, so this has changed from year to year. And last year, it had this, instead of a title, it was the middle initial. We don't really need a middle initial. It's more important that we know who it is when we come there on site, who it is and what they do. So you will have to type that title in here. For multi-sided, somehow we broke this and it should be fixed tonight, come tomorrow morning. This name here for multi-sided, and if you don't, if you aren't multi-sided, just disregard what I'm saying, but we have site maintenance and that's where all your sites go. And I'll, we'll go over that here in a little bit too, but it should be auto-populating from that site maintenance. And right now you can type the name in here and we don't want that. We wanna make sure that the person who's responsible at that site is in site maintenance and it should populate here. So that way we know when a person at a multi-sided one changes. So if you're filling this out now and you have the ability to change this name and you're multi-sided, just know come tomorrow morning, if that name changes, it's because we fixed whatever we broke. And it's coming from here in site maintenance. And again, if you don't have site maintenance, that means you only have one site that's done apply to you. But you guys do not have the ability to change site maintenance. You could come in here and view it. And it's very deceiving because it'll let you type in all these boxes, but then you get down to the save button and the save button's disabled. We need to disable all the boxes because people get frustrated because they're like, I've typed it in, but it won't save. And it's because we don't want you to save it. We want you to report to us who it is so we can make sure we get the right information. So whoever is listed right here for that site is 
if you're multi-sided, it's who should be um, populating right here. So if you type something here today, it's going to probably change tomorrow if it's different over inside maintenance. Um, if you're multi-sided, this will be where you can open it up and click yes or no. If you're affiliated, if your sites are affiliated, affiliated that means it's part of your legal entity. Almost all of our sponsors are, have affiliated sites. It's really just our only at-risk programs that have unaffiliated. And if you are unaffiliated, there's more things you have to do. You have to have site agreements and all that. And we will make sure that we have that and let you know that we need it. But I think everybody in here, I don't know, we may have, no, I think we all have people in here with affiliated sites. So if you're um, independent, single-sided, it's gonna be grayed out like you see here. You can't even click on it because it doesn't apply to you. Okay, are you licensed or not? Yes or no? If you have a DHS license or if you have a license through the health department, that's what we're after. We wanna know, are you licensed to provide adult or child care? You might have other types of licenses or certification, but that's, we don't need to know about those. This is specifically about if you are licensed to provide care. And we do have institutions that aren't. And it's really just our at risk, um, those that operate less than the 15 hours a week. And it's important that you mark no, because when you put no, it grays out your license capacity because you don't really have a license capacity. Um, if you don't have a license, you don't have a license capacity. Your building might have a capacity, but you don't have a license capacity. But the vast, vast majority of our people, it's gonna be yes. You operate in more than one state, yes or no. If it's yes, you gotta list all your states and it should have pulled forward if you had it there last year. This is one we get, it's pretty simple, but we get mistakes on it a lot. Um, public schools, only our school districts should click that. If you're a tribe, and most of our people are not on the above, we do not have any private schools. You might consider your child care center some type of private school, um, but th not the kind that are on CACFP. So if you're just a daycare center, a child care center, adult care center, you're none of the above. Type of institution. So if you're a single sided, you shouldn't, you would not be able to click this like you can see me doing here. This should be set to where it's whatever is on the front page is what's here. If you find that that's different, let me know, but we're really trying to make sure we're being consistent. And in the past, you were able to check something different here and it really should be how you came on originally approved. So if you were approved, if you are a child care center and you were approved based on your Title 20 participation, that's what should be marked here on this form. And so we grade it out for you guys so you can't just accidentally click the wrong thing. For multi-sided, you're gonna be responsible for clicking the right thing. Nine times out of 10, you're gonna all, if you're a private nonprofit sponsor, all your sites are probably gonna be this, but you can have all kinds, a nonprofit sponsor can have any type of site they want. So make sure you're clicking the appropriate type of institution for that site. Eight, you're selecting the type of facility. Um, if you're a child care center, obviously this is what you click or would have already rolled forward. Make sure if you're, if you have a Head Start, program in your center that you've selected that. And then if you're at risk, this is what's gonna be selected here. It's important for you to know if you operate at risk that um, you can't change any of this because there's specific requirements for you to be at risk. And so if your data determination has expired, um, you can't claim, it's gonna lock you out. You'll need to get with Jennifer Pryor to get that updated. I really don't think, we have a couple of at risk in here. So if you have questions about at risk, call her. Otherwise, I'm moving on. Um, all this should roll forward, age of en enrolled participants and your license capacity. Obviously your license capacity should match if you truly are licensed what your capacity is. Section 2A, your hour of operation, that didn't change. Um, your dates of operation, this is one that we get um, errors on from time to time. I go ahead and fill in this stuff. So when I try to save later, it'll actually save. Sorry. Okay, so the dates you should put here if you're a renewal are these. Oops. Because you are applying to participate for this whole year. We see this mistake mostly with our schools that operate. Um, they on um, other programs, they get their fiscal years mixed up and you'll put like your um, school year dates. You'll put like August to May. Well, you're cutting yourself short. First of all, this application is not good for anything prior to 10-1, but it also extends beyond May. So everyone that's renewing should have these dates. 
if you're brand new, just put the date you're filling it out and then the end of the fiscal year. Because when we come out to your approval and we get your official effective date that's issued by your consultant that comes out, I will come back and change it. We did change this. We want you to select um, the days of week which you will operate. Most of you are gonna be Monday through Friday, but sometimes we have four, sometimes we have six, and we wanna know which days are those. We don't want us to do anything. And then report your number date, number of weeks per year. E's asking if you serve meals and shifts. So you can have two shifts of any meal. If you need a shift, we need to know why. And most of the time it's because of school schedules. So just give us a good description here of why you have a shift. On F, all you guys are gonna see is this. You won't see any of this here. We turned that off several years ago because this actually gives you access to months, the month of the year, to claim. Well, you're, we really shouldn't give you that kind of power to turn your claims on and off, but sometimes we need you guys locked out for a reason, whether maybe you have a bad review and we just wanna hold things up to get, to get it resolved so you don't make any more mistakes. Um, or maybe you're an at-risk program that at risk, you're not eligible for June and July because you can only operate during the school year. Or another good example is say you're, we have a lot of Head Starts that um, contract for meals with a public school. Well, a public school can only give you a prices for the, the fiscal year they're on, but they have very specific rates they have to charge you. So you couldn't have a contract outside of their fiscal year because their rates change every July, just like y'all's. So if you contract with a school for your meal service, to, for them to provide you meals, we're only gonna approve you for um, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May, and June. Because in July, the rates will change and you gotta get a new agreement. This is just a fell safe way for us to make sure that when July comes, we have that on file, okay? If you don't contract with meals, you, op you make your own meals on site, that doesn't apply. And we would approve you for all months. Section 3A, um, we changed this up a little bit, made this box bigger. A lot of you will come here and just copy and paste this. And while the example is good enough and we can't turn you away because of it, we ask you to give us a little more detail. Tell us truly how you're taking your meals, make, taking your meal counts, okay? Um, really the only wrong answer is saying you'll base it off of attendance. That's, that is not okay. So don't put anything in here about attendance because that's not how your meal count should be taken. We made some changes here to your meal times, um, and you will see your meal times moved forward from last year, but you need to update some stuff because we added this little thing here. So if you're not at risk, you won't even be able to select these. We need a way to know what the meal time is for, um, for which program. And sometimes we have institutions that have a site that does both. And so it gets confusing. So we wanted a way to be able to know if you serve two PM snacks and ones for your regular CSAFP kids, but then you have one for at risk. That way we can know which one's which, okay? So because this function didn't exist until now, we just stuck it in here. All of your meal times move forward and they both say no. And let me show you. So I'm gonna put in a breakfast. Where I type stuff in and it goes away, maybe not. Okay. So now you, I got a meal inserted here. When you guys look at yours, they probably both say no. Okay. You're going to need to update that. If you forget it's on a deal breaker, we can fix it for you after the fact. But here's how you need to fix it. You'll click edit and then it's going to be no. And you'll come over here and click yes. If you're just, if you're just the ACFP, it'd be the opposite if you're just at risk. Or if you do both, you can select either one. But click edit make sure you change it to yes on whichever one you should and click add update to make sure that you have yes on either CACFP or at risk depending what you are. You will have seen that we get this message that says meal time changes must be submitted to SE on that meal time change form. And no, you don't have to submit that for application renewal or if you're brand new. Many of the new things that we implement come because we had some kind of audit finding, and this is a good example. 
And so anytime after your application is approved and you change your meal time or something um, that would require us to change the section, like your maximum number of meals or things like that, we have to have that meal time change form. The reason being is we had an audit finding. So say you put in supper and you were claiming suppers and you claimed October, November, December suppers. But then after the new year, you're like, you know what? I'm not gonna do suppers anymore for whatever reason. And you come in here and delete it. Then August or April, May, later on, our auditors come and they pull up our claim data and they say, well, ABC Daycare claimed all these suppers in August through or October through December, but I'm looking at their application and there's no meal time. Why did you pay them for a meal they weren't eligible for? It's just one of those system flaws. The system knows, and you guys have experienced that. I'm sure that if you ever try to claim a meal type that you didn't have a meal here, it won't let you, but there's no proof after that meal time is gone. So that piece of paper is simply for auditing purposes for proof that, yes, this, this was really what it was at that time. So for the purpose of application renewal or brand new applications, you do not have to send that form in. Section B is also another one that's been evolving over time. Um, this used to be the directions to your location and nobody used that. And then last year, I think we changed it to comments. Some of you might need a place to put comments to um, note something that's just out of the ordinary that you wouldn't otherwise have a place on this form to record. If so, put it up here in your meal counts, or you can even put it in your shifts um, if you need a place to put a comment. But this is just an attestation statement for you to know that your records have to be kept on site, you have to maintain them daily, and that in the event that you ever take them away from the site, which you shouldn't, or take them away from the location that you listed on that business maintenance page, we will give you an hour to produce them. We don't care how you keep your records. We don't care if it's in a box in the attic. We don't care if they're all electronic and on your laptop or in a file cabinet locked away. We just need you to understand that we need to be able, able to come where you say they are and you're able to produce them within a timely manner so we can conduct our review. Section C, is this a public or private nonprofit institution? So we added, we kind of snuck this in last year, mid-year and tried to clean it up. If you're a tribe, if you're a military, if you're a public school, you should also be answering yes to this now. It used to just say, is this a private nonprofit institution? And this really kind of overrides some of the requirements that you guys don't know, public institutions also don't have to do. Public or private nonprofit institutions do not have to comply with this 25% um, eligibility requirement that for-profits do. So this kind of toggles that on and off and, it, and you don't have to fill it out when you shouldn't be anyway. So make sure that's appropriately um, marked. If you're renewing, this should say yes, because you participated before. So make sure we don't need like the exact date, but if you participated in a program before, um, if you're a brand new applicant and say you were a family daycare home provider, let us know that um, so that we can track it. Make sure if you're a Head Start that you do mark yes, you're a Head Start. That's one of those things where I don't know why we ask things more than once and we're trying to clean that up, but we ask it up here and we ask it down here. So just mark it appropriately. D is how you're preparing your meals. Most sites, um, okay, let's see. Your multi-site form would not let you change CACSB at risk. Um, so you're, Pam, you're trying to change your meal times. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and are, are you at risk too? Do you do both? No. So, hmm, make a note of that or maybe Lisa can look it up. I don't know, we'll look at it real quick. And so you're trying to change it to where yeah, you're just trying to change it towards your marking yes on CACFP. She's just trying to update her meal time. Right. So I'll say no. And when you click yes, so did you click edit and then click yes and then add meal? Add update meal? I don't think I did that. I'll go back and do that. Okay, try again. All right. All right. Thank you. Okay. If not, like I said, it's not a deal breaker. We won't kick it out because we can change it ourselves. But again, anything we less we have to click, the quicker we can approve you guys. All right, so seriously guys, speak up. That's why we're here. If you're going along with this and some done work, holler because we wanna fix it now. Okay, back to down here. Most sites, you're only gonna have one of these to click, but you have the ability to click whatever reply. Like most of you, it's just gonna be one. We wanna know how you're preparing the meals. So do you have a kitchen on site? You cook your meals. 
that's most of you. Do you have multiple sites and you're preparing in a central kitchen and then you disperse them? That would be you. Or are you under contract with one of these type of um, entities? If you click this, you're gonna to have to put the name of that vendor, school district or food service company. And then we have to have that current um, agreement or contract on file. Number of enrolled participants. Always your number of enrolled can be greater than your license capacity. Um, that's not uncommon. And then on for-profit sites only, you have to fill this out. So if this is not grayed out, that means you didn't mark that this is yes. But if you are a for-profit, this needs to say no, and you've got to come over here and fill this out. And then depending on whether you were approved based on your Title 20 or based on your free and reduced is where you put the numbers on this side, okay? And how you know that, if you're an unsure, go up here and see what's marked or go on your business maintenance page like I showed you before. Because this all ties back to your original approval. So way back in the day um, when this program came about, the only way you could participate is if, oh man, I left the page and now I'm gonna fill it all out save again. Anyway, see now it's grayed out, so I wanna say no. No, it's probably not gonna let me. Anyway, way back in the day, you can only come on if you had 25% of your kids that were on subsidy. But then several decades ago, they changed the law to where they allowed public institutions and private nonprofits and other institutions that didn't take subsidy. And so another way that a for-profit could be eligible is if at least 25% of your kids have free and qualify for free and reduced category, right? Most of you come on as Title 20 because that's what's regulatory. That's the first way we look. Um, doesn't mean you can't be based on just your kids that are free and reduced, but it just, you have to put numbers in where you were originally approved. There's no benefit for one or the other. It doesn't matter. As long as you have 25%, your claim is still calculated the same based on the number of free, reduced, and not eligible. So if you accidentally click over here and put numbers in this side, but you're really Title 20, it's gonna give you a message that says, hey, um, you can't do that because you're not free and reduced. So you're gonna have to come over here and put them over here. Clear the mud? Okay. Section D is gonna be one, we're still, we're still working on it, but this kind of takes the place of that dreadful question that we kicked everybody's out last year, where we had to tell you, list all your site personnel and their names and their, their duties and titles and all that. We took that question away. You may not notice that, but if you're a renewal, that question was there and now it's gone. We just kind of beefed this up to make it work better. So here's the one problem with this right now. This rolled forward with what you had, but all the duties are gone. And that's because it's just a new function and it couldn't roll it forward. You typed them in before. So what you're gonna to have to do, because if you go down here and try to save, it's gonna be like, hey, wait, you're missing your duties. You're gonna to have to just delete it. And that is just something we didn't get fixed in time. We're working on an edit button, but it's not done. So you're just gonna to have to come in here, delete all your positions and re-add them. And it's important for you to know, you gotta have, you might just be a small childcare center and you wear a million hats and we get it. If you're that person that's the owner and director and you do it all for CACFP, that's fine. But make sure that you're recording at least one person that does the, the admin side of stuff and someone that's also doing the operational because somehow someone's got to be providing, unless you're contracted with someone to provide meals, and it would be noted up here. But if you're not contracted with someone to provide meals, you got to have someone on site that's, you know, peeling the carrots and cooking the carrots and serving the carrots. You also gotta have someone over here that's buying the carrots and recording the carrots and all that. So it might be one person or you might have several, but make sure that you have all those you know, responsibilities noted for that site. And then whether or not you use our money to pay for that salary. And then here, this used to be up here, kind of just, we didn't have a better place for it. We brought it down here because it really is about site personnel. Do you contract with someone to do any of your administrative responsibilities? There are companies and individuals out there that do that, and you can. It's not against regulation. It just has to be properly procured, and you have to have a contract on file in order to let that person um, be responsible for your admin duties and to pay them with CACFP funds. So we just want to know who that is and see the contract to review it to make sure that it's um, adequate. But not, there's not really many that do, so that's fine. Section E. So if you are multi-sided, this is no. If you're independent, sorry, I had to think about that. If you're independent, 
this is going to be different. You're going to have kind of two sections of your ethnic breakdown. You've got your actual enrollment, and then you've got your potential beneficiaries, which is those other great big number. Um, for, for sponsors, that's located on the sponsor application. We'll look at that later. But for everyone, you have to report the actual enrollment broken down by ethnicity and race. And for the last couple of years, we've had this, if you've been on for a while, you remember that this is probably one that catches people and confuses them, but every child has an ethnicity and every child has a race. And prior to COVID, it happened right about when COVID happened that they came out with guidance, USDA came out and said, you cannot, you can no longer visually observe the race of a child. And I always like to show a picture of my kid just because I'm partial, <laughs> I'm partial. but it, it serves a good point, right? If I didn't want to provide a race for my child on his enrollment, what would you assume that his race is? You would assume he's just a, your run of the mill, blonde hair, blue eyed, white child, but he's not. He's actually also Japanese. You would never guess that. So my child will be misrepresented, re represented every time I know it. So that's a good example of why we can't just look at a child and assume anything. So we turned it off to where these didn't have to all add up and match your enrollment. There was also an issue, I remember being on y'all's side of the fence, because I used to be at a sponsor, and the way it worked is if all these had to, all these five races, these only five races had to add up to equal your enrollment, each child could still only be one, which still wasn't accurate. So to kind of deal with this issue of not being able to look at a child, and then you have a parent who doesn't want to report, because they don't have to, we should encourage them to, um, the only way to, cut, to get around that problem and have the numbers still match your enrollment is to add some categories. So now we have not reported on both of these, and then we have two or more races. So I would mark Asian and white on my child, but you would count him as two or more races now. So we can be multi-race in CCFP in Oklahoma now, we can report that correctly. Or if it's not reported, you just put it in not reported. But this number has to add up to be your enrollment, and this number has to add up and be your enrollment. And then if you have the extra section about your um, potential beneficiaries, that's just like, that's just the racial breakdown of your area of the children that could potentially benefit from the program in your area. If you don't know what to put there, call your local school. You could go to what's called hometown locator. Am I making that up, Lisa? Hometown locator. You can't find that information. Yet. Google that um, or call us if you need help. And well, then, they can call the school. yeah, you can call school the school. Should they should be able to rattle those numbers off because they have to collect it too. And then you just have to check this. You got to take your training. If you've not had your your annual training and you check that, then that you're not telling the truth and you can't you can't submit it yet. You're not supposed to. So it's important to know that the right person's had training. Who's the right person to have had training? It's going to be the person that's listed in this box right here with a few exceptions, right? We might have some huge organizations where the board president or something like that, they're not gonna attend. Superintendents, um, it's not gonna be a superintendent of a school, it's gonna be that really that next person. I mean, we encourage the superintendent to attend because he ultimately is the one responsible. But we know sometimes we have those larger institutions where it's just not feasible. So if you're unsure of who needs to attend training to meet that requirement, send me an email because I can help you figure that out. And that's it on this form, then you submit it. There's a few changes. You're just going through and updating the stuff that I showed you that's new. Any questions? Okay, so the administrative budget. If you're a renewal application and you, you suffered through last year with us and we all, we all have PTSD, I, I mean, I, we had some issues last year with this budget and it was an attempt to make things, um, you know, we, we, need, we need to collect more information from you guys to make sure you're viable, right? But it was very convoluted and difficult, that budget. And we admit it, like we, it was just not good. So we made some big changes and we hope the changes we've made are um, easier to understand. Um, we're still asking for the same way, same things, just in a different way. So if you're a renewal application, your requirement, part of your requirement for it to be approved this year is to send in your annual expenditure and reimbursement worksheet. And we've created one for you and you can use that one. Or if you have your own type of profit loss, 
that you can print out and send us, that's fine. It has these supported by your 12 months worth of expenditure worksheets that you've done that that report corresponds with. But once you do that annual, you're gonna, this is gonna be so easy for you. From independent folks, the, that annual worksheet that we created for you is going to match this budget exactly line by line, okay? And the idea is that you take what you actually spent and you inflate it by 10 or 15%, I mean, who knows how much our food will continue to, and the price will continue to inflate, but we need to account for that. You wanna inflate those numbers and that's what you put in your projected amount. It's a projection. We don't need down to the penny. It's never going to be exact. Your end of year report, that should be exact. You, it's done, it's over, you know what you spent. This is a projection for the next 12 months of what you think you'll need to operate CACFP. So hopefully that will make doing your budget a little easier. It's gonna certainly make it easier for us, us in the office now because before we were just arbitrarily saying, well, yeah, that looks kind of reasonable or oh, no, I'm not so sure. It's gonna eliminate those questions because we're gonna see how you actually operated and what you actually spent our money on. And if it reflects, your budget reflects that, just a little higher amount for inflation, you're good. We have no questions and we'll approve that. And so whereas last year we were making you guys put figures in all the columns and it was because of the way the budget was set up. So we made you report something in all those areas because we know we, we know you have salary expenses. We know you probably have some type of rent or lease. We know that you are paying utilities, but you may not have been using our money to pay for it. And that's where it was confusing because then we were having to figure out percentages and all this and everybody was just ready to strangle all of us uncertain. So here's the deal now. If you truly didn't use our funds to pay for that, you don't have to report it in these boxes. Like if all you used our money for was food and milk and CACFP related expenses, your expenditure worksheets are gonna show that. Whatever you reported on your expenditure worksheets is what you're gonna project onto here in an inflated amount. And we're not gonna make you put something in these other line items if you truly don't use the money for that. Now, I would say if I'm, and I am helping approve applications, if I come across one and all you have is food and, um, food related, I might encourage you to plug some numbers in up here because here's the thing, we don't know what's ever gonna happen, but if there comes a month that you made more than you spent on food and milk, you need a way to spend it. If it's not in your approved budget, you really shouldn't be doing that. You're not allowed if it's not in your approved budget. So you might plug some numbers in in other places that you might need to spend those funds if you have money left over because you cannot make a profit off of this program, okay? So that's what part A is. You're telling us what it's gonna cost you to operate DACFB based off the prior years. If you're brand new, you're just gonna kind of take um, what it costs you per month to provide those meals and multiply it by 12 and inflate it a little bit. It's still just a projection and it's gonna be a little more difficult for those of you that haven't operated for a full year, but it's a guesstimation. And this is never set in stone. If you see as the year goes on, you need to go put numbers somewhere else, go, go put numbers somewhere else. You can always revise your budget. Because when we come out to do a review, we're gonna look at this and we're gonna look at expenditure worksheets. And if you're using our funds on your expenditure worksheet to pay for part of you know your salaries, but it's not in here, we can't allow that. So make sure it's accurate. And then each of these sections is important to have a um, click the save button. Each one has their own save button. So make sure you click save. Oh, and one other thing, if you put something in miscellaneous, I would encourage you to make comments about it just so we don't give more information, the better. So we don't have to ask questions. Part B is the one, I gotta get a drink. Sorry guys. Part B is the one that still kind of blows everyone's mind because we need to know all your other expenses. And um, this threw people for a loop. I know it still is a touchy subject because we're asking for um, bank statements and things like that in a review. We're not trying to be nosy. We're not trying to look at anything we shouldn't. Money, our, the money that we pay you guys goes into generally your commingled account that you use for your other business expenses. We have to be able to see record of that. We don't care how you spend your other money. That's, that's your business decisions. We don't care. We just need to know that you spent it because we have to find out if you're viable or not. 
And so that's where it's kind of confusing. On CSFP, you cannot make a profit, but as an organization or a business, you've got to be profitable, meaning you can't be in a loss. You can't have an operational loss. And there's no way for us to determine that if we don't know all of your expenditures and all of your income and revenue, right? So up here in part A, we're just making sure you've got an amount projected and a way to spend our money to make sure you spend it all up. Part B is you're telling us, what does it cost you to operate all your other um, institution, your whole other business? And again, it's just a projected amount. You need to think about it kind of like how you're reporting on your taxes. You should be able to know, I mean, if you're running a, you know, a successful um, business or organization, you should be able to know and pull up your last fiscal year expenses and project what it would cost for the next 12 years. And again, we don't care how you spend it. It's just, we got to know that you spent it. Because if we need to find out if you're viable, if you're reporting to us all your income, and this is how the budget prior to last year, you guys reported your CCFP costs, and then you told us all your income, and you had these great big profits, which weren't accurate because you weren't reporting all this, okay? So again, round numbers, we don't need exacts. It's just an estimate of what you're paying for all your other expenses. The one thing that might be a little tricky is to remember, you got to remember to prorate any expenses that are also paid with CSCFP funds. So say you put part of your director's and owner's um, labor up here, which is allowable. Make sure you don't put the rest of it. I mean, you can't pay for all of it up here, right? Just a portion, a reasonable amount. But don't put the whole other amount down here because then you're going to kind of double charge yourself. So that's when it might get kind of tricky. And then we've left some blank lines for you to put in stuff that these categories may not capture. And then remember to save. Part B is your income for your entire institution. So we want to know your income, any kind of income you're making. And prior to this year, we always had you include CACFP funds, right? Well, CACFP funds is not income. It's a reimbursement for expenses that you're already incurring. Um, you're already required to provide those meals, right? This program, the intent is to um, increase the quality and the variety of those meals, okay? And so it's just a reimbursement for something you already did. So it's not an income. So we took it out because if you were to put that you project making $30,000 off CACFP and when you come down to your profit loss, you show that you only have a thousand dollars, you know, profit. Well, that tells me that you needed that twenty nine thousand dollars to make ends meet. You should not be using these funds to make ends meet. This is above and beyond what you should already be able to do. So now it's not in here. You've got to report to us all your expenses, all of your revenue to figure out here down in Part D. It, this all auto calculates for you guys. Click that and it'll tell you what your profit loss is. If you're in the red, it will literally be red. It'll have a negative and it will not let you submit because you can't operate if you're not a viable institution. Part F, if you recall, was its own form prior to last year, but we just kind of dumped it on here. One less form for us to have to approve, one less for you to have to submit. But we did make a couple of changes. So, um, it was a debacle for a long time, maybe not a long time, a couple of years. And we're never prepared to change anything until we have it in writing to know we're not going to get dinged for it. So here's where we've been telling you guys one thing, and it's not, it's not true. Um, Title 20 is not considered federal funds. And at some time it was, sometime in the past it was. And at some point it changed, and we don't know what, but COVID changed everything and now it started being questioned why are we requiring you guys to report title 20 subsidy right here because it's not and we have it in writing from both our auditors and usda that that in fact is true now we don't know when it changed so when you're reporting your numbers here you got to report your cacfp funds expended and that's another thing that changed we used to say received and all this debacle of trying to figure out our title 20 funds federal funds or not we also found out that it's not, you're not supposed to be reporting what you received. You're supposed to be reporting what you spent, which obviously if you didn't receive it, you couldn't spend it. But we want to know what you spent. What total funds did you, of CSFP, did you spend in your last fiscal year? Which should 
somewhat match, if not match exactly, the annual expenditure that you already created for us. Okay. If you spent more than what we paid you in reimbursement, then you're going to put your reimbursement amount. Okay. Otherwise, if you spent less, you're going to report what you spent. Here, if you only receive Title 20 and you don't have any kind of other federal funding, it's going to be zero now, whereas we used to force you to put Title 20 here. What I have had questions on, and I don't know yet, it's been questioned if tribal funding is considered the same because tribal also has their own <laughs> DH or their own subsidy. I don't know. All I know is I have in writing that Title 20 DHS subsidy does not count as federal funds. If you feel like tribal funding um, should follow suit, we're not prepared to change that until we get it in writing. So if you got someone I can talk to so we can figure it out, send me their information. Otherwise, you got to report it. So the only thing I'm telling you not to report here is DHS Title 20. And so the whole purpose of this is if you spend over $750,000 or more in a year in federal funds, you have to have an annual audit. Not the audit we do, some other outside organizational audit or single audit or what have you. Um, and you have to put the date of that audit here. If these numbers don't add up to be $750,000 or more, you don't need to put a date here because we're not talking about our audit. What we do is an administrative review. When we say audit, we're talking about some other outside financial audit. And then remember to save. And that's it. And then click submit. Any questions on the budget? If you're multi-sided, I'm going to switch over to that. This is a little bit different, but more or less the same. Um, for those of you that are single-sided, don't go anywhere, because I got some other stuff we're going to go over after I switch over to a sponsor so I can show them their form. So ignore all this because you can't do this. All right, so I switched over to being a sponsor. The only thing that's different for you sponsor guys is that you're gonna have multiple applications for participations for however many sites you have and you have the sponsor form. I'm, I, I don't think so, but before I just assume, if you are a public school district and you do at risk only, can you let me know Otherwise, I'm going to skip a part altogether and not even talk about it. If you don't speak up, you're going to miss it. Okay. All right. So this is your sponsor application. A lot of this is pre-populated from other areas, and all your information is going to roll forward from years prior. Just like on those other applications, this is going to be populated from your business maintenance page so that you have the right type of institution marked. Mark, make sure you mark that you're the correct type of um, institution, whether you're public school, private, tribe, none of the above. Most of you are going to be none of the above. Again, we're asking stuff in multiple places, but do you operate in any other states? Yes or no? Again, here, you're only going to see this section. This is where we control your claim access. Section eight or number eight is only for new applicants of sponsors um, that you need to list what areas you plan to serve. Number nine, you're reporting your number of sites or facilities and number 10, the total, and total participants of all of those for each site added together. 11, again, we like to beat dead horses and ask things. So we asked for this again, total federal funds. I didn't catch that because that's what we're asking now and down, way down here. So probably next year we're gonna take that off. It's the same question, but you're gonna report it here again. If your fiscal year is wrong, if you recall, you need to change it on the um, business maintenance page at the very bottom left. Are all your sites affiliated or not? Um, yes or no? Yeah, if you're truly gonna to report to us your fiscal year, um, which like I kind of said, it's it all kind of comes out in the wash. 12 months is 12 months, but if Truly the right way to do it is to report on your fiscal year. Your last completed fiscal year was last year, 2021. So that is correct. If you operate January to December, that's what you're gonna give us. Okay, um, so most of you are gonna be yes. If it's a no, we harass you and get what we need anyway. So most of you, if you're multi-sided, you're a yes. 
This has the yes, you got to serve all the participants the same regardless of anything. And then 14 brings us to our budget for sponsors. Part A, I'm not going to go through all this as in depth because not much of it's any different for you guys, other than you have more line items here. And simply because you guys have more expenses that are required, you know, um, regulatory, you know, that requires you, you have to travel and you have to train and have all these other expenses that maybe a single sided wouldn't. So um, we like, I just went ahead and broke it down so that you had more spaces to define those expenses a little better. Otherwise, nothing else has changed. Part B, same thing. So if you're a multi-sided institution and you do something more than CACFP, um, which really only, the only people we have that are multi-sided sponsor and only a CACFP is gonna be our family daycare homes. And we don't have any in here, I don't think. So everyone else, you're gonna have huge numbers here. These are independent ones. You're gonna have great big numbers here. If you're a community action agency, if you're gonna put all your institution, you know, like you guys have all kinds of other programs, it should be a projection of all of that, right? Because you have a big, big pot of money that all your funding goes into and all your expenses come out of. And that's what shows your viability. So you're gonna have great big numbers here. And you might have to get with your financial person to get those numbers that we've never really um, asked for until these last couple of years. Same thing for your part C, you're gonna have great big numbers. If you have lots of programs in your agency, um, your DHS funding, you're gonna report all your income. But the one difference that our uh, multi-sided sponsors, our center sponsors is what you're called in regulation, is that you have to comply with the 15% rule. And you might have noticed in your claim every month, It'll, it'll tell you what your 15% is. There's that little note on your due claim summary. So it is regulatory that when you are a sponsor that you cannot use more than 15% of your reimbursement to pay for administrative costs. And so what administrative costs are, um, are is one through seven here. These are all administrative costs. So this automatically totals it for you. you you'll have a number here based on what the sum of one through seven is. You're going to put in your projected CACFP reimbursement, and it's going to put here what is your 15% of that reimbursement, and whatever's listed here cannot exceed what's here, and that will determine if you're in compliance or not. So if it says you're not in compliance, it won't let you save, and you're going to have to either um, increase your CACFP reimbursement or decrease your cost. And I would advise you to decrease your cost because you can more easily decrease your cost than you can guarantee that you're gonna get more reimbursement. So if you're in, if you're a single sided, this does not apply to you, you don't have this. Part E, um, just the same as before, it's gonna automatically calculate it all for you, but you do have to put in the number of sites here. How many sites do you have? Part F, same. Nothing's different here. And then part G, I'm not even gonna talk about because we don't have any family daycare homes in here. Let me try, I'm gonna have to, trying to get to the next page. Lord have mercy. See, I can't even get through our own. There we go. Okay, page two. So last year we had four questions here in section A. Now there's only two because that was something where we were asking two of those questions on the VCA. So um, we just removed them. If you look in the prior years, the four questions are still there, the, the two that we took out, but there's only two here. Um, make sure those responses are still applicable. Your ethnic and racial breakdowns. So again, this is your total data. It's all your sites added together. It's not, it doesn't have to be exact. We don't get our calculator out and make sure that, oh, yep, you got them all added up exactly because if, you know, that fluctuates daily. So you're just doing the best you can with what you have at the moment that you fill out the form. Um, your potential eligible beneficiaries. Again, these are going to be bigger numbers because it's the eligible um, beneficiaries of all your er areas combined. And again, if you don't know what to put there, call your local schools, go to Hometown Locator or holler at us, someone can help you. Part C should have all rolled forward. Make sure your responses are still applicable. Um, 
most importantly, make sure your on-site monitoring staffing ratio is correct. So this number should match what your projected budget is for right now. And then as the year goes on, as you're adding and removing sites, this should always be updated because you always have to make sure you've got enough monitors. And like I said, this is the data from a family daycare home. That's the only ones we're gonna have with that many sites generally. Um, I don't know, we might have a couple of at risk that have that many sites, but you've got to change this. It's very specific depending on if it's a metro, a site in a metro area or a rural area, because you got to make sure you have enough full-time employees to monitor those sites, okay? So just make sure we're really paying attention to that. If you send us an ad form or a drop form, you got to update this too. And you got to update your monitors. Make sure you've got the right amount of the right monitors and they have adequate hours. Section D, none of this has changed. It's got to say, yep, I'm going to do my training. Tell us your training plans. And um, instead of a person's name, it should be a title here of who's going to conduct the training if I can spell. Any questions on this? If you are not multi-sided, none of that applied to you. You can unplug your ears now. Okie dokie. So another thing we changed here is that for a couple of years, a few years, we had you guys locked out of uploaded documents because it kind of got chaotic um, because you, if you remember in the past, if you've been on long enough, you could go in here and upload a file and you can say it was any kind of document. And when you had certain documents that were required, we had folks that was just, we'd find blank pieces of paper. It was just a mess. So we locked you guys out and said, okay, we're going to take care of this. Um, but we've, figured out that's a little too restrictive because you need to get in there and see what we have because then you're submitting your application and you're just, we're getting a deluge, of just tons and tons of um, paperwork. You're faxing it, you're emailing it and it's stuff we already have, but in all fairness, you don't really know because you can't get in there to view it. So get in here and see what we have. When you come in here, this is all gonna be grayed out. We don't want you to have access to upload anything. That might change in the future because I think we need to have a better way to, for you guys to submit to us stuff without having to email it. So maybe next year we'll, we'll make some changes. But for right now, this is grayed out and you also can't delete. We want you to be able to go in and see, hey, do they have the right contract? Hey, do they have the right license? So on and so forth. And we only need you to send us something if it needs to be updated or if it's missing, okay? And then some of these things should have ruled board already checked for you and already approved. But if it's got a check here, it's something that's uploaded, and if it's uploaded, it's required to be submitted before you can submit the application. So if you're getting an error about you got to submit this, come, you just simply come up here and click the box is it, and say, yep, it's there. It was right. And even if it's there and it's not right, go ahead and submit it because it won't let your application go through, but then submit the corrected form to your person. Something that you need to remember, though, is you have to send your end of year report. It's the annual one plus the supporting documentation, the 12 months worth or however many months if you're new. And this is just for a renewal. If you're a brand new person, you're working with me on your VCA and you've already sent me a ton of months worth of stuff. You have to send your organizational chart. If you don't have your own organizational chart, um, we made some templates for you. We don't need names, we just need titles. That's just to help us identify the people who we need to um, contact and reach out to, who does what in your institution. Those are the two things that you have to make sure you send. We cannot approve your application until we have it. So if we get to your application, it's been submitted and it's not there, we'll just have to kick it out and, send, and you'll get an email that says, hey, until I get this, we can't move forward. And most importantly, because it's truly gonna be instrumental in helping us approve that administrative budget. Okay, this form. Um, okay, we added this. So you gotta make sure you tap your name in here. And this is simply just kind of to cover our all of our rears so that you have to acknowledge that yes, you've reviewed all the forms, you've checked your business maintenance page, so on and so forth. The reason we added this extra step is because eventually more of these forms are gonna roll forward, still submitted and still approved. And as that happens, we need you to acknowledge that yeah, I've, I've looked at them, nothing needs updated and, and we're good because we don't want people just coming in here and because it's easier just submitting it without looking at it. You still need to review it. So this is just you certifying that you did that. So you gotta put your name in here. And something I always like to point out too, we know that folks share user accounts. It's not okay. It's um, probably not legal either, 
but we can't, we can't make you not do that. We can just tell you not to do that. So if you're logging in as someone else, or if you're letting someone log in as you, you should stop. You should reach out to your person and get it. Well, actually, we change that. Go to the resource library, get a certificate of authority, fill it out, send it to it with your, with your driver's license. If you're in there filling out application and you're in there logged in with someone else, obviously that person is giving you the authority to do it, but you shouldn't be doing it as them. So if you're logged in as someone, say you're logged in as Bob and you're really Fred, and you type in Fred, and then we see it, you're logged in as Bob, but Fred submitted it. That's a problem. We're going to have to kick it out because we cannot have someone log in as someone else. So make sure you're not doing that. And then once all of your forms are submitted and all these are checked, you've got your name in here, then you can submit to app, application to CMP. So we added this last year to help us track when you originally submitted last year or the year before, I can't remember. So from the first date that you submit, that is going to be a, a moment frozen in time down to the second. That way we know who to honor for October, like I said before, because you might submit it and we might turn around and kick it out for corrections and you might resubmit it again. All those dates are going to continue to change as you resubmit and we kick it out, but that your original date of submission will be frozen in time so that we can honor October if you originally submitted by October 31st at 11.59 p.m. Okay, so after you've submitted, we have 30 days to review it and get back with you. And again, I don't think it's going to take us near last year. We were oh, maybe March. We were still, I think we we're still approving applications in March last year. It was bonkers. Maybe, maybe into June. It was crazy. It was crazy, guys. So it's going to be better. But just know we still give us some grace because we've got hundreds of you. And I will be the first one to tell you, if you're on this training because you got a response from me or any of us that said, have you had training? Um, it's not that we don't wanna answer your questions. We just physically cannot have enough time in the day for us to sit on the phone with everyone individually. We'd love to, we just, it's impossible. So don't be frustrated or feel like we don't wanna help you because we said, you need to go to training instead. We just don't have time. Um, so on total federal funds, you do not put what you get that is correct. You do not put what you get from OKDHS. You do not have to put that. And if you did in the past and we had to make you do something extra, uh, we're sorry. We won't do it again. So just know that we have 30 days to review it. We'll get back with you with any corrections. But I would advise you that monitor your application because if you ever see a check mark here, They won't stay because nothing's submitted. But if you ever see a check mark here, that means we've gone in and reviewed it. Something's wrong. We need you to correct it. And if you'll click the, the details box, and it's not working now because nothing's submitted, so I can't reject it. But uh oh, sorry guys, I'm all over the place. Um, when you click on that, this little a box will appear with details, and it'll tell you what's wrong. It might just say, "Please submit form," because we might just need to go in here and fix something real quick and resave it. Do whatever it says, send whatever needs to be done and redo it. Um, we, oh yeah, there we go. Oh, I, I approved it. Yeah, hold on. Oh. There we go. So that's what it's gonna look like. And we'll we'll kick it out. It'll kick out your application and it'll put it back in a pending submission status and we'll just be like, need new form. And we'll save it. So if you come to your application and you're like, I approved it, why is it pending submission again? Go on here, find where it says details, click on it, and it'll tell you what you need to do, okay? We try to get back with you um, within a business day. Either you're going to get an email from the system or you're going to get an email directly from us saying like, hey, this is what we need. But you're always going to find probably find more detail here too. Any grant money you have. So somebody asked about grant money. If it's COVID grant money, no, if that's what you're asking about. On federal funds, and we weren't sure about that either last year, and we finally got clarification from USC on that. Any federal funds, funds that we got because of COVID, I mean, they came from somewhere federal, but they are not considered federal once they're in your hands. It's not a federal award. But if you get some kind of a grant, um, I will tell you, if you have PPP loans or whatever, any kind of grants that were COVID funds, 
and they are helping you make ends meet, you would report it in your income, but you don't have to report it as a federal fund expended. And I know that sounds backwards, but it's not subject to that audit requirement. And that's what all this is about down here. So it is an income that makes helps make you viable, but it's not necessarily a federal award. Um, okay, what else? You gotta be make sure you're um registered with the Secretary of State. We've that's another new requirement. It's not, we don't, I promise we don't sit around and think of new stuff and be like, oh, we're gonna make them do that now. It's because something else has happened and we have to. So we're moving to a new payment system, not by our choice, but we definitely need to go that route because the current payment system we're on is literally so ancient that it's in our basement and it's in glass. And if it ever breaks, we're all in trouble, okay? There's no parts for it that exist. There's no people that exist that even know how to work on this piece of machine, okay? And that's what our payments go through right now. We've got to get moved over to this new system. Um, and because of that, now we have to make sure that you guys are in good standing with the state and, and that that entails a lot of things. So our easiest way to solve that was to get you guys to go and register with Secretary of State if you weren't already. Um, you might be a sole proprietor and as a business that's not required, then we're just asking you to go and register your trade name. Reason being is we can't have two people, we can't pay two, two ABC daycares. We can't do that. So we have a lot, we have more than one ABC daycare on the program. We have a lot of stepping stones. We have a lot of names that are used over and over, but that might not truly be your business name. So we need to get that cleaned up. And some of you might've noticed that that's changed. We have two, you, we have your entity, entity name listed and then your DBA. So if you haven't taken care of that, go do it. You do not need to send us anything because before we approve your application, we'll go to the secretary of state and we'll search it ourselves and make sure you're good. Okay. Um, if you have questions about that, honestly, other than the telephone number and the information we sent out and posted in the resource library, we can't help you any further because we just don't know that process. We can't help you. You'll have to take care of that yourself. The other thing I haven't talked about is background checks. So if you are a nonprofit, if you come here and yours says not private nonprofit, you are a private nonprofit, you have to have, a, you have to submit to us a background the consent and release and copies of your social security, your driver's license and payment for that report. And that's just one of those things. We have this group, um, our private nonprofit group. A lot of you guys might have already gone through background checks. The only exception to this rule is if you're a single-sided daycare center and you're a private nonprofit, you do not have to comply with this. The reason that we can allow that exception is because we already know you've been back, had a background check that's at the national fingerprint, all that even more stringent than ours. We know you already had that. But if you're a private nonprofit sponsor and you have lots of other sites underneath you, it's not the sites, it's the sponsor people, the people at the sponsor level, you gotta have that background check. We know your sites have already done it. And the reason we're doing this is because like I started to say a minute ago, we have this group of private nonprofits. It's just an, a unique group that come in and you might have, you might not be licensed. It's mostly going to be like our at-risk and our family daycare home sponsors um, that they're not subject to any background requirement before coming onto our program unless we initiate it. And that's why we're doing it. So we've had individuals that have operated that have come on as at-risk sponsors and we've had family daycare home sponsors that they run their own private nonprofit. And they're not subject to background because they are their own entity. And so they obviously didn't get their own background check. But we have had instances when people should, you know, had situations where they had no business um, operating with federal dollars or maybe even being around kids. And so I think everyone can support us trying to make sure that you know, our participants are safe and that um, they're also we're increasing the integrity of our um, program. If you are confused as to whether or not you need a background check, um, email me. I have a specific list. I know exactly who needs it. And the vast majority of people have not submitted it to us. So it has to come to us directly. If you've had one already, we can't accept what you've got on file for the same reason. Um, well, people alter stuff through the magic of Adobe. It's insane, some of the altered documents we've gotten. So you have to submit to us the consent that is in the resource library under general forms, right here. Fill that out, send in a copy of your social security card, your driver's license, and a check for $15. And we have to process it ourselves, unfortunately. So if you're required to do that, 
and you've sent it in and I've not yet gotten it yet because I'm the one that's going to be processing them. If not me, it'll be Jennifer Weber, the executive director. That information is stored in a secure area. It's not going to be shared with anyone. It's confidential. Um, we're going to go ahead and approve your application if you've submitted it because we're still working on our process internally to get those um, processed, but um, we're not going to hold up your application approval. So if we approve you and it comes back later that you're like a serial killer or something like that, we will have to deny your application at that point and send you appeal rights. But if you've submitted it, <laughs> if you've submitted it to me and you don't hear anything back, no news is good news. You're good. Okay. Um, if you are were seriously deficient in a prior year, you've got to do your VCA. So if you got you got that letter from me, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, then disregard. I'm just trying to think of any, anything else like that. No, I think pretty much okay. Any questions? You guys are a quiet group. Any questions whatsoever? Make sure you get your stuff sent to your person. Lori Burroughs is fairly new. Um, you're welcome to loop me in to anything you send her. I'm still working with her. She started a couple months ago. Um, so I'm working with her training still, so bear with us. I don't have anything else. I'll hang out here if you guys have questions. Otherwise, you're free to go. This does not meet your requirement for training, though. This was an optional training. So if you still need training, you need to go to CACFP manual training. And the next one is on October 19th. Go to your training calendar, register. Um, yeah, we can have Kendra send you the recording of this training. It kind of it takes a little while for us to get the recording back. But we can send it out to you. Do we have one already? We might already have one from a prior training. We'll find one and get it sent. I can't keep up. Yeah, we can send anyone that registered a, a, a copy of the training. No worries. We have another one Saturday morning, Tiffany. Um, if you need to hop on, if you need something to do Saturday morning, we will be on here at 10 a.m. It is a lot. It is a lot. Yeah, um, Leanne, yes. The answer is yes. I got a direct message from someone. You can do that. Any other questions? All right. Thank you guys. If you do have a question, I put my email up there. Um, you can email me. Uh, you can always call us, but we are swamped. So we will get back to you as quickly as possible. All right, thank you guys. Take care, have a good day. It's the slides.